Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Options Trading 101, a multi-part series that basically gets into the beginning nuts and bolts of options, what it is, how they work, etc. Uh, if you haven't seen it, if you go back to the prior video, I kind of lay out what all I plan to cover in this series. And this series is going to adapt as I move along. If people give me comments and or questions uh, in the comments down below, I'll see about making sure that I include some of that additional information as best I can. So again, let's get into call options here in this specific session. So call options, there's lots of different terms around options, contracts, expiration, strike price, assignment, intrinsic value, gamma, vega. We're going to cover a lot of these as we go through this entire series. But the first thing I want to start with, and I'm going to put this at the beginning of a number of these sessions, is just the basics of an options contract. So an options contract gives you the right but not the obligation to either buy or sell a stock at a specific price up until the expiration date. Now, whether it's a buy or a sell, that depends on whether you were the buyer or the seller of the option, etc. Again, we're gonna get into all those nuts and bolts. It's a financial instrument, and contracts are often used by investors to hedge against risk or to speculate on the future price of an asset. Now, hedging against risk, how that happens and why options really originally came to be is because that's a way that people can buy insurance on positions that they hold. If I'm a long-term investor <clears throat> and I've built up a significant amount of assets, possibly in a retirement account or something along those lines, and I feel there might be some volatility or a sell-off coming up, I can essentially buy put options which are, again, we'll get into the details of that, but it's a form of insurance on my long-term positions to where if my long-term positions start losing value, those puts I purchased will gain value. Again, we'll cover that in more detail. So there's really only two options out there. There are puts and there are calls, but you can have four positions because I can be the buyer of a call which gives me the right to buy. This is a bullish position if I'm buying calls. You can be a buyer of puts. I buy a long put that gives me the right to sell something at a certain price. This is considered a bearish position. I would use a buying a put if I think the market might go down. Now, I can be the seller of a call. That is a bearish position if I'm selling a call I have an opinion that the market is, and when I say the market, I mean that whatever stock I sold the call against, I have an opinion that the market is not going to go higher than my strike price of that call. In other words, it's gonna be bearish. It could also be considered maybe neutral if I'm selling that call above the current price. And then over here, if I'm the seller of a put, that means I would have an obligation to buy if the price went below a particular strike price. That is a bullish position. So I'm going to lead off again the next few slides recapping this same information because this is, this is the critical understanding, if you will, of options. Those are the positions that you can have. Now, one of the things I find that helps people understand a call option is to explain it in terms of a house. So let's say I might get relocated somewhere within the next 12 months, and I already know whatever town I'm going to, I already know the perfect house that I want if I end up making that relocation. So I might approach the owner of that house and offer them a $10,000, I'm gonna call it a premium, that gives me the right to buy that house or call that house to me. I'm buying a call for a half million dollars within 12 months. So in options terms, I am paying a premium to own this call, the right to call the house to me. My strike price is a half million dollars. My expiration is 12 months out. So for all practical purposes, these are the same things that in an options call contract that I buy is doing for me. 
I have the right to buy that house, but not the obligation to buy it. The seller of the call, however, does have the obligation to sell it to me if I want to buy it. Okay? They don't have a choice in that matter. So a call option in stock terms. Again, the call options are bought by investors who believe the price of the underlying asset is going to go up. The buyer of the call option can exercise that option and buy the asset at the strike price, which will be a profit for the buyer of the call. So in other words, if that house, um, if I move there, I'm going to go ahead and buy that house for $550. If I'm a speculator and I make that deal, I think the house is going to go up in value. I think that house might go up to you know, $550, $600. Therefore, me spending the $10,000 in premium was great. Whether I relocate there or not, I can still exercise that and have the right to buy that house for $500. And if the value's gone up, okay, I can... Take it for $500, sell it for $550. So the same is true of a call option. If I buy a call option on 100 shares of Apple stock, and I think most people probably know this, but our standard options all represent 100 shares. If I buy or sell one contract, that's basically giving me the right to buy or, sh or sell 100 shares of stock. So if I buy a call option on 100 shares of Apple with a strike price of $100, Apple has an expiration date of three months, not Apple. The, um, uh, the contract, the call contract, has an expiration date of three months. The premium for the option I might pay is $5. If Apple stock goes up to 110, I can exercise that option, buying the 100 shares of Apple at $100, because again, that person is obligated to sell that to me if I wanna buy it. I would then turn around and sell those 100 shares of Apple at 110, making a $500 profit. So that's the $100 per share times 100 shares, and the $5 premium is again what I paid for that. But uh, that would allow me then to make essentially $5 per share in profit on that stock. If the price of Apple fell below $100 in three months, I would not exercise that option. If Apple fell to 95, I'm not gonna pay hundred dollars for it there's no sense in me doing that but I did lose my premium so call options can be a risky investment but they can also be really profitable if the price of the underlying asset rises in some cases I've done what are called leaps where I buy an option that might be a year or two out on a speculative stock uh, I did this with Avgo as you've seen in videos that I've done here um, I bought the Avgo 40, I believe it was the $47 leap, and Avgo is you know trading many multiples of that now. So you can have hugely profitable positions off of a relatively low investment. I did not have to buy a hundred share, or excuse me, I have multiple leaps. I think I have 10 of them. I didn't have to buy 1,000 shares of Avgo stock. I simply bought 10 long-term call contracts for much, much less than what it would cost me to buy those shares of stock and have achieved significant profits with those. So the key features of a call option. The seller of the call option has the obligation to sell the underlying asset at the strike price on or before the expiration date if the buyer exercises that option. The premium is the price the seller received for their call option, and it's the price that if I'm the buyer, the price that I paid. The price that I paid is the maximum loss that I can suffer on that particular trade. The strike price is specified at uh, the buyer can buy the underlying asset and the seller must sell it if called away. In the case of Apple, it was the $100 strike price. In the case of the house, it was the $500,000 price. The expiration date is the specified date which the option expires. So call options are positively correlated. What that means is that if I own a call option, it follows the price of the stock, usually a little bit less because we're paying a premium for that. But if the stock goes up, the price of my call option goes up. If the stock goes down, the value or price of my call option goes down. Now there are other factors that come into play here volatility, 
general greed in the market. How badly does somebody want to buy my call option? So other factors come into play, but the call option will generally follow the price of the underlying stock. So that covers call options, a little bit of a rudimentary understanding of them. Next, we're going to get into put options. So we'll see you back for that one here in a few days. Take care, everyone.